Hello everyone, uh, my name is René Bernard and I work in the New York Cure Excellence Cluster and also for the Quest Center of the BIH. And I'm going to talk to you uh, today about the basics of good research data management. And um, yeah, so uh, before I start, I want to start with a small disclaimer that this will not be very comprehensive. So this is just the beginning and the first steps um, that are needed to, to be taking re good research data practice management and uh, the rest then of course develops from this. So and of course this will not replace um, an entire uh, big investigation what is needed and also accepted in your specific type of research. So we will cover really just the surface. But uh, the goal is again to the data that you have uh, to make them reusable for others, as this is the ultimate goal of good research data management. And there are different ways to reach that goal, and we're going to talk about this today. So in the beginning, uh, when it comes to data sharing, you know, which is the ultimate goal, maybe you've noticed in some publications that you can see data availability statements, and they say like, well, data are available upon request or upon reasonable requests and uh, you wonder well is this data sharing uh, is this what i'm supposed to do uh, should i follow this lead and i say absolutely not because this is actually what you want to avoid because these are all euphemisms for not being able to share data and there could be many reasons for this uh, you know most of the time people don't have the time really to organize themselves uh, um, so that others understand it uh, it's a big effort and giving away these data for free so people wonder what's in for me with this so um, and a recent study has also shown this this is not just a feeling that you have, they really went after over 1,800 manuscripts and showed and that's, that had that statement in there. And uh, more than 90% of the authors either declined or didn't even respond to the request of data. So um, with what we're going to talk about today, we want to avoid this. You want to be really in a 10% and provide really usable data from your uh, studies. Um, and why would you do this? Well, it's becoming more apparent that more and more funders um, like um, Horizon Europe, uh, whether it's the NIH also in 2023, and also our very own DFG and also the BMEF um, um, are now basically requiring you already in your applications to say s something specific about uh, what you're going to do with your data, you know, how you're going to share them and uh, uh, um, how you're going to use NFTIs for this and even encourage applicants to list already shared research data in their CVs. So this is something that is really coming uh, for all of us that we have to deal with and uh, there's no opting out anymore. Uh, that's why it is important to do this. So, and you often heard the word fair in there. And uh, this is a principle bill. This was introduced in 2016 uh, in a paper and uh, it's an acronym that stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And that makes it also nice and catchy because again, these principles apply really to all kinds of data and research, whether you are, I don't know, a geologist or a microbiologist, you know, it's, it's sort of in, not very, uh, it's open to all kinds of data and uh, retains the validity still. So even if you break it down to the smallest unit, that you collect sort of the really raw type of data that you have. And what it has already in there that uh, 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 which was revolutionary at the time is that uh, um, these uh, data should be uh, accessible and uh, usable, not just for humans interpretation, but also for uh, machines. So, and when it comes to this, we, you can, you know, go by and look and say like, what can I do and how hard is that really? Well, to make your data findable, you know, uh, again, it's relatively easy. You give them a persistent identifier, which you automatically obtain through most uh, um, public repositories these days. And accessibility, think of it as, I don't know, like a guard that says like, well, you can access these data well, for freely if, you know, 
uh, or you have to provide us something with some more information, you know, and or maybe we just uh, provide you with the analysis script, or you have to uh, give us your question, and uh, we can run this through our algorithm and provide you with the answer. So um, that just all kinds of accessibilities are possible, and therefore it's not to be mixed up with open data. Okay, so fair data are not open data. That's uh, important to remember. And uh, but these these I and R are really the hardest things. So metadata and data should use a standardized and a controlled vocabulary uh, through that have references to other data and be machine actionable. So and also reusable for humans and computers to understand them and to have a clear uh, data license. So um, and we're going to talk about a little bit of how to make this I and R possible for you. Okay, so again, what type of data are out there from an organization point of view to understand this? Uh, also, which are the most valuable data to share, how they organize them, uh, um, and um, what are metadata, and how I can enrich them, and where to share. So this is the quick overview. So how do we get to data actually? So it all usually starts with a research question, and then for this to answer, we also need an object. Uh, this could be anything. This could be a plasmid, a brain slice, an organism, gene product, anything, you know. And uh, basically, we do some manipulation and experiment. We apply our different conditions for this. So we take different snapshots over a period of time and not do anything, just do nature, do this course. And from this, we, abs we abs abstract the raw data. So this could be images, recordings, videos, some kind of measurement. And this is our first shot that we get. From there, we do some normalizations. We apply inclusion, exclusion criteria, and um, um, use computational algorithms also to process them to make, for instance, um, data comparable that are reusable from, from other experiments that we performed. And then we have you know, processed quantifiable data. Uh, and then again, we apply like a specific uh, algorithm or statistical approach to, to analyze the data. And this is what we then have for publications. And that's what we end up and that's mostly what people see. And the rest is sort of like in the dark. And the objective is basically with research data meant to give everyone else the same chance that you had. So to go back and go to the process data, to the raw data, basically the rawest form. Most often the object is not possible, but sharing things in the rawest form so that uh, other people can then uh, apply their uh, algorithm and reanalyze the data in their um, specific manner. So uh, therefore, again, uh, which data are best to share? The data you believe from your experience and also um, if you think about a scenario, if I was given the data that I produce, which of these are really the most useful for me that I can do something with them to reanalyze? So in its rawest form and uh, with like minimal to almost no modification if possible. So this could be, for instance, the original format that uh, the device you recorded with uh, uh, gave to you, plus uh, also a list of open formats. I'm gonna, not going to talk about closed and open formats today, but um, again, there's a list of open formats uh, you can uh, look up, but always supply things in both forms. And you need to explain in a separate file how you got from the raw data to the analyzed paper uh, data so that people can really follow again your steps that you took and uh, then understand again your analyzed data and maybe you know it's not the worst thing if they sometimes discover things in your data that was not right so many uh, uh, corrections these days come from people that reanalyze your data or he, somebody else in your lab reanalyze the data and discover the mistake so it's no shame actually uh, uh, if this happens because you want the best data to and analyze data to be out there and um, if you use an r package for instance always provide uh, the code uh, in github 
um, yeah, so this is a typical thing for scientists to do to save data. Uh, uh, yeah, usually in, in a weird way, sometimes with strange acronyms, um, not writing it down or just out of memory before you lose your data. So again, uh, backup strategies are important, but also organizational skills. And that's what we'll cover then also soon. So what do I actually need to uh, um, uh, document when it comes to data management? Well, you need general information about your uh, project, about the goal of the studies, the people that were involved, the goal, the different roles, uh, all kinds of method information. So the protocols that, that were used, the, the, the analyses that were performed, uh, all materials, suppliers, where they come from, software that you use to record the data and also the versions and the metadata, very important. And especially metadata specific informations like variable names, definitions, the units of your measurement, and if applies also some ontologies. Um, then when it comes to analysis, again, uh, the programs that were used, the, the, the types of analysis that were performed, the codes, uh, the algorithms, and again, the software. And all this information, again, uh, should be uh, in a separate readme data file along with the information uh, um, about the, the study, maybe study results, maybe even also where they were uh, ultimately published. Um, so, um, how do I document? Well, many people sort of like wait to the end of the study and say, oh, I better write this down. No, uh, this is not the best way to do this really. It needs to be in a structured manner throughout your research. And uh, it's actually best if you think about how you do want to document this way, way before you start. So, but I'm going to come to this. So, uh, since most of us live in an electronic world, so use an electronic way to, to document your daily work, like an electronic lab notebook. And uh, once your data set is ready, you can maybe with one node or whatever, select this node and attach it to it, to your data set. So, you know, actually all the processes these were in there. If you work with R or Python, uh, use, uh, for instance, Jupyter Notebook or um, Studio, for instance, uh, to actually document all the steps that, that, that you took. And uh, it's a great annotation tool that will help you retrace your step later or somebody else again. And for those of us who love Microsoft Excel spreadsheets, well, there's also ways. Um, it's a um, program that's called Collecting for Excel that is able to add documentation cells to the first row that contains all the variables. It's a free tool. You don't have to buy this. And then also, once you fill this out, uh, it gives you the possibility to export this again, this, these, these descriptions that you have in there into a separate documentation file. Um, um, again, once you share your data but so you have it all basically your variables and your description in uh, this one excel sheet okay so difficult thing again i need to organize myself and uh, um, in, in a way so that i know where my data are and where i keep uh, uh, also my manuscripts how am i going to do this and usually it happens often serendipitously that uh, okay we write something and then somebody looks over this and says like yeah you're good to go do the experiments we get some protocols and I don't know. So we usually end up with like one project folder and everything else a mess. It's organized, unorganized there. And uh, at the end, it's, it's really hard basically to follow, especially once you look at it five years from now. So therefore, it's important to find your own uh, structure. And again, here's a, just a suggestion how to organize this uh, again develop a structure that fits your type uh, of data of type of research again certain hierarchy should it have uh, not more than four levels deep and uh, again always consider uh, uh, keeping uh, data raw so prevent this from overriding so for instance that uh, make sure that data are set to read uh, uh, and not to uh, rewrite and always spec up data. So be consistent with this method, stick to it, uh, ask what others use in your lab, and it would be even best if you develop uh, a lab standard, even though that's sometimes really hard to achieve. 
So a few hints again, uh, how to organize uh, different things with files and filing names, uh, use meaningful abbreviations. Uh, there's a general way, basically, how to organize your uh, your dates in a, uh, in a specific way. It's the ISO formats, the YYOY, YMMDD format. Uh, so this could be, for instance, at the end or at the beginning, and also identifiers for people. So usually, if you give uh, files a name, go with the most general thing to the most specific thing as suggested here. And don't forget to use file numbers versions. Do not say final, pre-final, final, final. This will never work and then it's really hard to find. Okay, so this brings me to metadata. What are metadata? Well, it's relatively easy. It's data that describe our data. So uh, my favorite example is, for instance, a picture that you take of, um, let's say, your favorite object, which could be a cat, for instance. You know, so you take this picture and uh, then you look at it, it's like, okay, this is this cat, and then you could describe the cat. This could be some of your metadata, but the device that you took this with provides you with a lot of other metadata that you don't even think of at this moment which are absolutely brilliant to have sometimes. So for instance, uh, where this was taken, what, what, what camera was used, uh, what exposure and so on, and, uh, um, and who took the picture. So, and the same is true also for your own data. You know? So uh, you have certain information that you want to keep from your settings, like, okay, what day was it? Was it uh, uh, during the light phase, during the dark phase? What device did I use? Uh, who was present and recorded the data? And so on and so forth. But the devices also give you lots of information. You know, for instance, where they calibrated, when were they last calibrated, and so on. So very many things that uh, attribute also to the validity of your data. And if you think about these could be all different kinds of variables, uh, as you see here in the, the next row, for instance, where you have like an employee ID, a first name, a last name. So these are all data and people need to understand what does NIN mean? What does department ID mean? Huh? So for somebody who works uh, with this data, it's pretty clear, but for somebody else, it's not. And therefore you need to have a metadata dictionary. That again explains, again, the name, uh, what data type is behind this, and a general description or the units that was used. So there are other things, uh, again, for that metadata uh, that are also important, like administrative data or the history, like a version of a file that, that's use, used. Uh, but I'm not going to go into this really deep. This can be looked up anywhere. So um, the question I often get is like, what, which are really then my relevant data? What should I uh, consider metadata? So um, there's some sort of general approach, thought approach you could use. So first of all, what are the questions you would like to address really you know, with, uh, with your data? And <clears throat> this already gives you basically an answer with uh, um, what uh, you should, or what other should, data you should record and maybe add them to a template. Uh, what variables are really relevant for the type of question that you want to answer? Again, there are certain metadata that are maybe interesting to keep and they you know, come as a byproduct, but they may not be relevant. So if it's a hassle to record them, just don't use them. Um, then compile relevant data from different sources. So as I said, it could be the room environment where you take things, or it could be a scale that you're using, or any other device gives you some sort of metadata. So uh, anything that you know gets in touch with your research subject or within the data processing uh, really uh, could uh, contribute to uh, the metadata that you uh, collect. Differentiate metadata that are available for most studies from the ones that don't occur too often. So, because that again gives you a minimal set of metadata that are very, very often used uh, in your laboratory or maybe also in your field of research. Um, and you can use them throughout and then only if necessary, maybe add others. 
And uh, ideally, you compare this maybe to some community standards. You compare what you have for your specific technique uh, with other labs, uh, um, you know, across the hall or um, within your your city or your country or you know even with your uh, collaborators around the world, and then you know what is really uh, important. Okay, well, we cannot sometimes travel around the world to find all this, but we have the World Wide Web, so as is a great resource. So three different uh, approaches you could use to find these minimal informations for your data set. One is fairsharing.org. So it's a great database, basically, with standards, with uh, databases, policies for uh, um, any kinds of, of, of data and uh, standards uh, that exist or there or were once started. So uh, again, type in basically your uh, specific data that you're looking for, like, I don't know, mouse stroke or any kind of field that you're working in and you will find things there. So and uh, probably then also the standard that you're looking for. For instance, the minimum information for biological and biomedical investigations is usually a good way to start. Second, um, use reporting guidelines. You know? um, they are uh, very, very useful because they guide you through uh, certain uh, uh, ways that make your data really uh, um, understandable, useful, and uh, reusable there. So uh, well, if you work with animals, for instance, arrive, uh, preclinical studies could be a res good resource, and also a consort study for randomized trials of humans, and so on. But uh, you can sort of search in there really deep uh, to find something that applies. Third is just a Google approach or PubMed approach, uh, again, with minimum information and reporting data. And often you find a publication uh, um, that um, already uh, has defined them. For instance, here, uh, one example from uh, a field I used to be active in neuroscience, uh, electrophysiology. And you see uh, there, uh, it's not really new, but uh, this set uh, is fairly large. It has uh, big headers, eight big headers, and sort of sub definitions. And then you can define these, you know, or say like, hmm, okay, this doesn't apply to my record. Um, and then you're basically through, and you have all your things covered there. So a great way to to start with this. Or flow cytometry. Uh, there's also a database for this, and they want you to organize your data in a different way, uh, different and specific way, and they explain also how this works. So also perfect again for uh, data sharing later. So uh, which brings me to documentation. What I told before is. Uh, the documentation starts way before you have your data and uh, you want to have really good uh, experimental documentation um, in uh, for instance your laboratory notebook and record both your data and your metadata so uh, best way to do this is develop a template where you capture both at the same time uh, if possible um, and then if you share this template uh, with your lab Nobody will forget also to record this metadata that you need. Okay, a spreadsheet data. Um, these are really the most common types of data because ultimately uh, most of our data that we have uh, ultimately uh, transfer to uh, a measurement, a value, um, and uh, are then organized in a, in a spreadsheet table and uh, they are readily accessible um, and they're also machine readable but you need to organize data in a certain way for this to work and um, there's a great publication in the american statistician uh, that explains this a little bit but if you don't want to read this i'll take you through uh, the nine most important things to remember when it comes to spreadsheet data and how to make them fair First of all, consistency is key. So for instance, if you have a variable, you know, uh, for instance, sex, um, use the same uh, 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 name for it. You know, don't just sort of like say, write it differently, even though we understand this, a machine will not be able to. 
same as for study ID uh, pick sort of like um, um, a, a name uh, or a way how you want to define them and basically stick with them. Um, then I already talked about date format um, with the global ISO standard. Um, use consistent phrases in notes. Um, so if an animal, for instance, is dead, don't say it's diseased or it's lost. Predefine it for yourself before and just use one phrase. This also could be one uh, important part of the metadata uh, dictionary that you defined before. Also check for hidden spaces in cells because again, this will be understood as a second entry. Uh, so can be happen before or after uh, a certain term. Avoid uh, uh, um, spaces again and do not uh, um, um, leave sort of spaces out there and use hyphens or underscores and avoid uh, uh, symbols that have a meaning in programming language. Make sure the text stays text. This is really a big problem um, in the genomics field uh, with, tr with transcripts like SEPT7 or OCT9 uh, that are often then uh, 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 converted by Excel into a date. And since uh, these are usually uh, Excel sheets with uh, thousands of transcripts, uh, sometimes 10 or 20,000 rows, you cannot easily detect them where this happens. So therefore, it's important, um, again, as you see it described here, to um, predefine uh, uh, these, these uh, cells as text before you um, uh, insert uh, the genetic information. Don't leave cells empty. Uh, always use not applicable or a minus or something else to, uh, uh, for this. Otherwise, uh, the computer does not know how to interpret this or um, people will think uh, that you forgot an entry here. And um, so there's a way basically to uh, add this also afterwards, after your study is done, um, and this is described here. Only use one information per cell. <clears throat> so I often see this, that people give uh, animals, for instance, like a very long name or certain experiments, a long name where all the conditions are in there. And then they think, well, I don't need to define this anymore because it's already in the name or in the description here. So no, really you want to have just one piece of information per cell, even if you make your cell longer. Um, second, um, don't mix units in with numbers. So either define uh, your unit in the formula, like body weight underscore G, or have it in a data dictionary defined. So, uh, and leave just really the number that you calculate with in the cell. Number five, well, data entries should be organized in a rectangle, so or a set of red angles, basically. So the first row should be uh, uh, just variables. And uh, the, um, the, uh, the columns uh, should be the samples uh, that you used. And then you have all the data in between. So um, yeah, that's basic. Uh, Premise to do this, and um, so you can break them up sort of into um, um, smaller par parts if it gets too long, um, because often you sometimes have repeated measurements. So then you have variable one, week one, or variable two, week two, and so on. Um, but we just have one value there and not have like, um, I don't know. Uh, a bigger higher variable sort of like that just is like repetition number one it makes things complicated so rather define this in your variable name um, just uh, use one worksheet don't use uh, multiples for this because uh, again you need to export them to a csv file so only use raw meta entries do not do calculations in raw data sheets. You know? So no mean, no standard deviation, nothing there. Again, as I said, no merge cells and do not use colors anywhere in your raw data files in Excel.
Again, create a data or metadata dictionary that explains all the, the variables, uh, again, that you have in this rectangular shape for in this first row uh, with the unit, with the definition, uh, maybe also an abbreviation that, that you use in there and, um, and keep it because most of the time, actually, uh, um, you can reuse this and um, add this also um, to the readme file text or uh, maybe have this as a separate file that you keep open um, available in your data uh, uh, repository. <clears throat> Seven, uh, use data val validation techniques also to avoid errors when it comes to entering data. So uh, again, if um, there's a certain range that you expect, for instance, with the weight of an animal, uh, this can really help you to avoid some typos if you have to enter data manually. Um, <clears throat> use eight safe data and plain uh, files and backup. As I said before, uh, um, use a CSV file. Um, be aware of uh, the German operating system used. Sometimes you have uh, comma separated values where you actually use a semicolon and vice versa. Um, a good alternative is the TSV file uh, <clears throat> was just tab separated because that's internationally understandable. Nine, uh, sometimes you have uh, observations uh, that you have and you put them sort of like in your comments field or your observation field that you have at the end. And um, you know, at the end of the study, you might notice that you had similar observations on multiple occasions for different or for the same subject. So um, try to convert this into a variable. So let's say your observation was, I don't know, uh, where something turned green or something like this or something that was present or just a little bit there or true or false. So you can use anything basically uh, to as your variable, as your value then, but uh, you could give it then a variable name. So, and uh, you could also use a scale for this, you know, say like uh, the effect was um, seen often or very strong uh, or not present at all. So. Um, just as an additional uh, thing, if you um, observe something that you weren't really planned to observe. <clears throat> okay, so that's two uh, um, spreadsheets. So I want to close basically with uh, um, the types of data, uh, data repositories that exist. So um, you have general uh, data repositories, uh, for instance, are big ones like Synodo, Dryad, and uh, Figshare, for instance. They are multidisciplinary. They uh, support many different uh, uh, file types. Um, they also have a persistent identifier a license. Um, they allow you basic documentations with keywords and categories and also link to specific journals and um, also uh, um, um, offer you different uh, storage sizes. And so you should uh, look these up and see what is uh, fitting for you. Then there are field specific um, um, dictionaries. Um, again, you find some maybe also in, in, in uh, <clears throat> in uh, repository guides, for instance, with nature or with uh, three, uh, re, three org, <clears throat> And uh, these are community based and organized and can be also technique oriented like facts. And they often use also a classification and ontology. And it's uh, great because uh, these where similar data are shared. So uh, it's, uh, you find probably then also uh, things from your colleague in there. <clears throat> And institutional, again, these are maybe pretty similar to general purpose uh, um, dictionaries, but they can be also field specific. And the advantage is that they are basically in-house. The data never leave the institution. And sometimes it's also easier for uh, data, data import and export if um, you have always direct access and uh, it's part of your infrastructure. So when you deposit uh, data uh, in a data repository, what else should go there aside from data? 
uh, if available again the, the analysis code or the uh, where to find that code the metadata that, that uh, you have in organized in your um, metadata file the description again of the study uh, available that explains the abbreviation units uh, linked uh, if possible a metadata dictionary uh, the license you want to give uh, to your uh, data for reuse for instance keywords uh, the authors and their org ID uh, related papers and very important also uh, want to name the funders that funded that study uh, uh, that uh, um, you for this data so a few additional resources there is a, a good course on uh, um, research data management from from Harvard data management if you want to really dive into biomedical research data um, you can always consult research uh, data team at uh, your host institution. Uh, there are also lots of other resources, for instance, uh, already Wikipedia. You can use Twitter uh, with a hashtag and also um, certain funders like Elixir have uh, also created some nice content, for instance, Fit Fair Cookbook and other resources. So, and um, yeah, what uh, there are different kinds of homeworks for you to do, uh, for instance, file organization and many other things, but what you should really think about um, that what I want you to do is create a data or metadata dictionary. So think about what data you develop and what other things you describe, and this will help you basically set up already a template. And again, with the definitions that, that, that you have, that people understand what you understand as your data or metadata or and uh, what units you use, for instance. So, and with that, I'm at the end of my uh, presentation and I'll thank you and I'll see you soon. Thanks again for listening.